Hello and welcome to episode 85, part 1 of Awesome Astronomy for July 2019. Now normally, this is the part of the show where whoever's hosting waxes lyrical about something very vaguely related to something that happened during this month at some point during human history. However this month, so much has happened in the world of astronomy that I'm following the wise words of Kimberly Sweet Brown Wilkins and uh, Ain't Nobody Got Time For That. So I'm ploughing straight in. What's occurring, my most festering Martians? Got a busy show. Festering? Yeah. Well, it's, you know, Martian flu season, right? Oh, well, that's true. You've seen yourselves. <laughs> That'll be why we're coming out in sweats. You well, are actually it's festering true. at the minute. You know, annual shed and all that. <laughs> 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 Hello. 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 Are we not talking about anything? Are we actually going to plough straight in? Because to be fair, we've got a lot of stuff to cover. You're hosting, Jen. You've got to you've got to give us some kind of clues as to what what's happening here. You can't expect the magic to just happen. <laughs> well, I was hoping that you know you might just sort of tell me what you've been up to. Why don't you ask us what we've been up to as you're the host? <laughs> <laughs> so what's everyone? I mean, to be fair, I did say what's occurring, and you never answered me. So I feel like this is your fault, not mine. <laughs> Are you going to ask us what's been happening? Okay, so what's been happening, Martians? Nothing. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ, it's like getting blood out of a stone. <laughs> oh, Paul, Paul, Paul pulled a kid out of a river today that nearly killed itself. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. I did, I did, I did just pull a half-drowned cub out of some water. <laughs> Well, it's been going on for a couple of months now, so I suppose it's about time we got round to talking about BBC's The Planets, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the the, the Brian Cox, the new the new Coxy series. What a real thing! Yes, I haven't seen it. I I don't have what? proper TV. What? I only have like Netflix and oh, now you're so TV youth. and stuff. Um, so I guess I can get it on iPlayer. Yeah, but I've been super busy. Oh, you've got like weddings and things, haven't you? Well, wedding. Mm. Yeah. So <laughs> not I'm just multiple like multiple weddings. Huh? Multiple weddings. You're not doing the Mormon thing. You're, you're doing like marrying lots of people. <laughs> Obviously, why wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th- I thought it was really good. Um, I mean, it's always a bit nerve wracking when you know. I, I don't know about y- uh, you, Jen, but put, certainly you'll remember it, Paul. The uh, the original series, the planets that Samuel mm, West narrated mm. in nineteen ninety nine. So this is kind of like the twentieth anniversary of that, and then they've re- redone it. And I was a little bit nervous, um, but I-, I think they've done a really good job of it. I mean, the way that they've done like a kind of narrative and a story that is purely chronological about the the life of each of the planets because we just know so much more now about the planets than we did 20 years ago and it that's is. a striking thing it is that that was the most striking thing about the series actually was was just how much has changed in 20 years because the, mm. the the samuel west series was was that kind of post voyager kind of era, yeah. wasn't it it'd come out of kind of the voyager had done the whole thing in the up to the late 80s and that that was a series that kind of followed all that that stuff well if you think that that's the era of galileo yeah exactly when Nobody even remembers Galileo now. No, 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 no. So much has happened since. Um, mm. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, it was a good series. There was a, a couple of bits. I the I did spot a boo boo. You even you got um, an apology from somebody involved in the series. I didn't did, you? I did, did. Um, because they they got he uh, sort of watching it, and then Brian Cox says um, basically about sort of um, the Shepherd satellites things, and then and, and stuff like that about how they debris orbiting um it was rings i think it was yeah i'm trying to remember now um but it was closer the, the stuff closer to a planetary body orbits more slowly yeah no no yeah <laughs> no stuff closer orbits more quickly um less distance to travel yeah exactly and so yeah that's um so i just tweeted i was like hang on a minute brian cox just said and actually the yeah um some of the one of the uh the, I forgot his name. Co-writers, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, said, oh, sorry. Yeah, we didn't spot that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, this is why you have an astronomer as the presenter, not a particle physicist. 
To be mm. fair, the guy who um, apologised is an astronomer. All right. So, so it's even worse. Yeah. <laughs> He just he said he, they just didn't spot it in the rushes when they went when they went through. But yeah, no, it was a good series. It was a good series. Yeah. Um, I thought I, looked- I've got to say that I am starting to get a little bit of Brian Cox fatigue though. Now yeah. uh, he, he's starting to grate a lot, and especially with the it seems to be just as much pictures of him walking around mountains or being Gazing on boats in the sky. as it is the actual planets. And I was thinking I'd rather have Samuel West narrating this because, <laughs> you, know, you know, the pictures and the, the story tell itself. It doesn't actually need uh, a presenter or, or yeah. any images yeah. of presenters. It just needs a voiceover, really. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I thought my, my only other kind of issue is I thought it was a bit US centric with the probes oh, and things. I- I'd not thought of that, but oh. yeah, I yeah. thought I thought it was like the, the Mars episode grated a little bit because it was it was all U.S. probes, and I know you know they, why did they not do a Mars Express thing at the? But end they didn't even mention it you know, once, mention sort of Mars Express or anything like. That. I was like, yeah, that's, that's a little kind of. It was yeah. a bit U.S. centric, but that was cool, you know. It, I it wonder was if a lot of the funding came from America then. Yeah, maybe. To oh, make sure. the show. I know it was done with mm. the OU um, here. The they have University. a lot of involvement in. East emissions, don't they? Mm, mm. But yeah, uh, that, but that was good. It's good. So, emails, Ralph. Oh, okay. Um, so our good friend Jared Bosale, I'm assuming that's how you pronounce his name, um, of no declared domicile. He wrote in for the benefit of other listeners. Um, he says, I suggest listening to your podcast at half speed when in need of additional good fun or between your releases. Jen sounds particularly great at the opening of episode 82. Uh, lo- love the show. It's my favorite podcast. Now, having tried this, because I read the email and thought, oh, I'll give that a go on episode 82. I didn't know which one he meant, part one or part two, but I tried part one. And I would definitely recommend it because it's one where... Jen is waxing lyrical about something. I've forgotten what it was now. But at half speed, it sounds like she's drunk and incredibly sarcastic. So it's well <laughs> worth going back and taking a listen. I need it's to have a funny. listen to that then. <laughs> but she is drunk and incredibly sarcastic anyway. <laughs> I will say that all my friends say that drunk Jen is the best Jen. <laughs> so maybe you, people are getting a little flavour of that with me at half speed. Maybe I'll be able to get it. And, and we can definitely say that at Astro Camp, the yeah. hungover Jen is not the best Jen. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, no. Is, Although, is she hungover... will go round and grab all the uh, the half-empty bottles of gin, <laughs> even when she's hungover. You can't waste good gin. She's unstoppable. <laughs> she's, she, when it comes to gin, she's like a force of nature. Yeah. Normal people say, oh, never again. Jen says, I'm swiping that. That'll come in handy. <laughs> oh, yeah. she, when you're a poor student, every little helps, right? <laughs> I'll take a pint of homebrew if you've yeah, got it. See, I mean, if it doesn't cost me anything, sure. The, the measure's going to be when you're no longer a poor student. And this continues. I mean, I'll still be drinking gin. That will not change. I'll just It just means that I'm hitting that old lady phase of drinking gin in my 20s, not in my 80s. But I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be on, by the time I get to my eighties. I'll be back on like you know the really vicious home brewed cider. I'll just Should do it all backwards. You'll be sitting on a park bench drinking white lightning, and <laughs> you'll have your own still by then. You'll be creating your own gin. <laughs> what from <laughs> from the piss of all the other people in my old folks' home? Yeah, just filtering it out. <laughs> Oof. Chucking Oof. a bunch of medicines in it, swirling the pills around. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Jen. You made Paul should have then. <laughs> <laughs> right, get on with this email then. Because we're going down a very dark path here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before we started recording, I remember you saying quite a few times, right, let's crack through this. <laughs> oh, I know. Come on, back on the emails. Okay, so our good friend Lee Stevens of Bellevue, Washington State, also wrote in, but to point us in the direction of a website that might interest you, dear listener. Uh, Lee says, guys, love the show. Paul's intro to June Part 2 led me to the realisation that your clever Aryan plan oh dear, um, includes <laughs> oh dear. rendering us puny earthlings helpless by having us all laughing too hard while you launch your invasion. <laughs> um, a friend just sent me a link to this incredible site. Perhaps your Martian Imperial general staff can use it to help plan out your galactic empire. The next logical step after you sweep our quivering, giggling bodies aside as you assume your rightful dominion over terror. 
Um, please remember who sent this to you and spare the Pacific Northwest when your conquest begins. And then he points us to a website at stars.chromeexperiments.com, which ironically works well on an iOS device, but I struggle to use it in Chrome. So did, did you guys take a look at this? No, no, I haven't. No. Not yet. Hang on. Do you know what I'm going to do right now? Copy and paste it into the interwebs. Hang on. I'm having a look. Ooh, it says loading the galaxy. Please wait. So, oh, it says yeah. fetching stellar data. Mm-hmm. Oh. <gasps> oh. Oh, what is this? Is it good? <laughs> <gasps> oh, my gosh. It's like I'm floating through a massive globular cluster. <laughs> you can thank Lee Stevens for that. Oh my gosh, Lee, this is amazing. This is great because this is the first time I've looked at it. So this is like <laughs> an actual reaction. Oh my god, and all the stars are different colours. Ooh, ooh. It's, it, you've got me doing it now. Hang on, ooh. hang on. You're going to hear my reaction. Your mind's coming. Oh my gosh. It's coming. Ooh, ooh. I was zoomed in. Ooh, you can zoom oh, oh. out. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, wow. Ooh. Oh. <gasps> Can you drag it around? Oh my god, you can drag it around! <laughs> oh, zooming through my the galaxy. God, I'm zooming in. I'm zooming in. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. So, uh, I should Centered probably, on the uh, sun. That's awesome. Yeah, so when, when it loads up, it kind of looks like you're looking at a big globular cluster, right? Hmm. And. Uh, oh, you zoomed in on one particular star. Oh, that's amazing. And then you can zoom in and out. So if you zoom in. It brings up labels of stars, which I guess are the closest stars to the sun, because they're right in the middle. Oh. Is the sun. Oh, look, we've got the Oort cloud. Oh, shit. There's the solar system. I appreciate that uh, Pluto's not on there. Thank you, guys, whoever invented this. <laughs> and, oh, look, there's the sun. And look, you zoom in and you even get some sunspots. Holy crap balls. This that is, is brilliant. That is awesome. Thanks very much for that, Lee. Lee, you are a god amongst gentlemen. Oh, my gosh. Th that's amazing. That is brilliant. Oh. And there's a thing that says take a tour, but I think we need to get on with recording, so oh, I'm going to press I'm, that I'm, later. I'm going to waste hours on that this weekend. Yeah. So uh, definitely go and have a look at stars.chromeexperiments.com. And we have no affiliation to it whatsoever, I should point out. They were genuine reactions. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And genuinely... Me and Paul had not looked at it. No. So I think that actually worked out quite well that we hadn't looked at it because it is mm. amazing. That's going to be mm. great fun. That's going to be a really useful educational tool. Ooh, I'm excited about that. It reminded me of um, that one, that website. Now, what's it called? The one where um, it mixes together the radio data, the... Uh, oh, uh, um, look at it. Chromosphere. Yeah. Chromosphere, yes. Chromosphere where it mixes all light in all different... Um, spectra or parts of the spectrum yeah so there's like a scroll bar on the side right and you can just go yeah. from short wavelength mm. sort of x-rays down yeah. through to the radio data and it's the yeah. plane of our galaxy the, the, all of these kind of things are just mesmerizing aren't they mm. and it's really nice to see data put into such a visual way and and you can kind of manipulate it and play around with it how you want so you can learn in mm. the way that you learn best and you know someone or a whole team of people have spent an absolute age on this and then they just give it to you. That's great, isn't it? Hmm. Hurrah for science. Hurrah for Lee Stevens. Hurrah for Lee Stevens. Thank you, Lee. That's great. Right, let's move on to the news, shall we? Why not? Music, music, music. So, the news, heads up, is uh, it's pretty beefy this month because it's just so much going on. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like astronomy like took some cocaine and stayed up for three days doing science and then slept for about two hours and then just did that for the entire month because there is so much happening. So, Paul, uh, kick us off. Well, I'm going to kill the mood, though. Oh. I'm going to kill the mood straight away. Because oh. big astronomy news I'm starting with is Spitzer has been killed. Oh, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Having said that, when was the last time a news story came out of Spitzer? Pff, yesterday's spacecraft. Yeah, exactly. Um, yep, they're taking Spitzer like a dog out onto the moor with a shotgun. Oh, you didn't hear that, did you, Huguenot? 
Yeah, oh. there it is. Come on, boy. It's time. It's over. So um, I know that yeah. you're shitting on Spitzer, but I will say I can't think of anyone in my office or like anyone that I've interacted with that hasn't used Spitzer data at some point or isn't using Spitzer oh, data now. It's been incredible. In fact, so it- I'm using Spitzer data right now to filter AGN out of my uh, galactic sample. Well, it's the only big telescope that's in the deep infrared, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. So it's the only thing that's getting us data in that yeah. part of the spectrum yeah. of any yeah. quality. So it's it's been killed. It's on death row, really. It's still working. It's on death row until next January um, when it will send its last data stream. Um, and then it'll be commanded to shut down and it'll leave it slowly oh. falling away from us in its Earth trailing orbit. So, oh, it's so sad. I know. So oh. Spitzer is an inf- it's an infrared telescope, as we just said. Um, it's one of the, the what's called the, the, the four great observatories um, that were launched by NASA. So it was the last of them. So the others being Hubble, Compton and Chandra. Um, and it ran out of cryogenic helium 2009. So actually it's kind of primary mission. It was only supposed to last five years. Um, so it went longer anyway in its sort of primary mission. But then it's, it's cryogenic helium ran out. 2009 so actually in the last 10 years it's been a very limited instrument in some some respects it's it's been operating at, at not its full capacity but has been doing some amazing work and uh, it's been discovering exoplanets it's it took the first direct light capture from an exoplanet um it's looked at galaxies in the early universe it's looked at solar system objects asteroids the other planets it's seen crystals raining on proto stars what i know That's insane isn't it? It created the largest, most detailed survey in the infrared of the Milky Way. Yeah. Just the most incredible bit of kit. Um, it's, it's done amazing service, but it, it's kind of been in the shadow of things like Chandra and, and Hubble. It's always mm. kind of been in the, it's in the background. It's a very underestimated telescope. I think Spitzer is a massive workhorse for the scientific mm. community, but it doesn't have the same appeal for the public that Hubble has, which means that it's kind of slipped under the radar and hasn't had it's- the publicity that it deserves. It's that problem that JWST is going to have if it ever launches, is that everyone's expecting the Hubble images and they're not going yeah. to be the same. No. Yeah, but I just think that with something like whether it's James Webb or, or, or with Spitzer, that because this, I mean, it's great for things like um, red dwarf stars, for, mm, uh, mm. for dust in the galaxy, there is so much that it can see and detect that, you know, it's kind of right, really fresh and really exciting in astronomy at the moment. That there should be, you know, news articles on the thing it's discovered almost weekly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And but and I, I don't see that. M- no. Maybe it's contributed no, to don't. peer review journals a lot, but you just don't see the big discoveries that you've well, been expecting it to make. The problem is, it, it, this thing's been on borrowed time anyway, so it was never expected to last. Whereas Hubble had a kind of, you know, it was expected to last a long time. This this mm. one hasn't. So it's always kind of, I think, it's never been pushed as hard in the media sense because it was never supposed to last very long. Um. But it's last 16 years. It's, it's gone on a lot longer than it was supposed to. Um, and they were essentially hanging on to it until JWST was up. Because essentially that would replace it. Yeah. But of course, as that saga's dragged on, so has the life of Spitzer. So it's, it's gone on longer because yeah. its replacement yeah. hasn't launched. It's a senior review in 2016 listed Spitzer as the lowest funding priority um, mm. in NASA. So that was kind of like the that was that was really its death, death warrant nail. being kind yeah. of like you know written then, and then since 2016 they've been looking for someone else to pick the mission up. They were they knew it was doing good science and they were hoping that a group of institutions could could fund it and run it as a mm. private mission, but oh, okay. that failed. They they the couple of people came forward in 2017. There were a couple of proposals. They didn't they didn't get the funding right. It, it, they couldn't run it. Um, so quietly in the middle of may um they announced that january the 30th 2020 will be spitzer's last day of work they did it in a in a blog post slipped mm. under the radar that one so didn't just it? Kind of slipped out and and they made big big fanfare afterwards when people noticed and they went oh no no it's going to go out of the bang we're going to you know be we'll celebrate it properly but there was this kind mm. of like they just sort of was quite like yeah and we're cancelling spitzer <laughs> Mm. Yeah. So it lived its life out quietly and its yeah. uh, obituary was given out uh, in the independent or something. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it was it's very that, much been like we're shouting, We're going back to the moon But Spitz is dying. So <laughs> Spitz is dying and, and yeah. yeah. But, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um the uh, there were a couple of comments I've seen of people saying that, you know, it was JWST 
has been eating all the astronomy budget. Mm. So there was never any chance of this ever being extended because they want James Webb to fly. If they don't put all the money into that to get it going, it, it so they've got to trim so, money yeah. from anywhere they can, especially now they've got Project Artemis. Yeah, so. exactly. So and it, and this is specialists working on this. You know, all the, the mission teams, things like that. They they can be redeployed and. That's so. That's that's the end of Spitzer. Okay, so we stick with exoplanets because well, Spitzer was a big exoplanet discoverer. Um, this time, you can get involved. The IAU, the International Astronomical Union, of which I am a member. Um, mm-hmm. you, if you're a member of RAS, you're automatically a member of the IAU. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's celebrating its hundredth anniversary this year. Boop boop. I have launched a competition to name exoplanets and every participating nation has a planet to name. Ah! So in the case of the UK, it's a gas giant known as WASP-13b in the constellation of yeah. Lynx. Um, and given that most of our listeners are from America... What's the the US, US one? Oh, do you know what? I, I can right. hang on. I can find out for you. Hang on. So if it's WASP-13b, then it'll be one of the planets discovered... By the same telescope that discovered the exoplanets that I was working on. Mm, that's right. Yes, of course. I was working on WASP 103, WASP 121. I can tell you uh, which one it is. Hang on. Uh, get involved. Hang on. I'm on the website. So the website is www.nameexoworlds.iau.org. Okay. And it's one of those odd. Um, addresses they didn't think about of course you end up with two e's so it's name with an e and then another e for exo world so it looks a bit mm. odd it's my yeah. sh- but you can go there and you can find out whatever country you're yeah, in. yeah so I, I can tell you straight away so north name. america here we go north america you click on you click on the area get involved and you click on the area so you click on europe or north america and we go to the united states of america F- yeah um <laughs> and they have star HD 17156 it's a yellow dwarf in Cassiopeia and the planet is HD 17156 B and I will say if they don't name it Chuck Norris I'll be disappointed <laughs> exactly or like WASP 13 is a bit easier to remember and it is yeah. <laughs> a gas giant it's three and a half times the size of Jupiter and has an orbital period of 21.2 days Ooh. and was discovered in 2007 nice there you hmm. go um, yeah, and so every country has its has its planet, and you you can go hey, if if the British one isn't Planet McPlanet Face, <laughs> then people take a long hard look at yourself. Absolutely, it, 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 this has got to be one for the ages. <laughs> it, the boat didn't work, the boat didn't work. They fobbed us <laughs> off with that little submersible boaty book boat face. Which, by the way, did you see in the news has done some really amazing work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did yeah, it's done some really did amazing science. That. Yeah. Anyway. The David Attenborough. The RSS David Attenborough launched Wait. the Boaty McBoat face. It's carrying <laughs> its, its little submersible. And the submersible did some amazing science about um, climate change and, and uh, current undersea currents and stuff. It, it was really cool. Um, so, yeah, Planet McPlanet face. I'm gunning for that. <laughs> I'm even going to might put that in myself. Um, <laughs> I beg your pardon. What? You might put that in yourself. <laughs> Gas giant that big. <sighs> Barely touch the sides. Um, <laughs> next news story. Next news story. Uh, and in a beautiful piece of scripting, I'm staying with exoplanets. Whee! And a study that suggests that the chances of that close encounter, well, they just got a little bit more remote. Oh. So I know. You see, I'm all about the, the doom and gloom, really, today. So, I, this one. I this love then? this story. Yeah, this was in Astrophysical Journal, um, and it's called a limited a limited habitable zone for complex life. Um, paints a pretty bleak picture for all those hopes of finding nearby life. Uh, and why? the mm. study looked at the toxicity potential of planetary atmospheres based on their location. Um, Around stars and and that idea of the traditional habitable zone. So you may you know the Goldilocks zone. Yeah. Um, Earth's supposed to be in where water can exist in all three states. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's not not too hot, not too cold. All the rest. Of it. And Venus is supposed to be on the front edge of it. Mars is on the back edge of it. We're kind of not quite in the middle. We're slightly to one side of the middle. But well, 
it's kind of in a way been slightly poo-pooed by this this study because as we, we we're getting better at this we're starting to sort of realize that it's not just a simple temperature thing mm. and so one part of this this study said that um you look at co2 so for instance planets on the outer edge of a typical zone so you think like mars for instance require a lot of co2 in order to stay warm mm. it's the greenhouse effects how it works mm. on earth we need to see we do need some co2 in the atmosphere and you need more if you're further out yeah. to keep the atmosphere warmer. It's just like having a thicker coat, right? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. for water to remain liquid, you need more and more CO2 to keep it warmer, to keep the... Well, you get to the point where in the habitable zones of stars they were looking at, you'd need so much CO2 that actually it would start to become poisonous to life. Uh, toxic to sort of the life on earth and you know. oxygen breathing life yeah well not co2 it, breathing life but it's the open one yeah hmm. but their metabolizing um, oxygen is the most like efficient way of getting energy yeah so they reckon that sorry i i've just i've read into this paper because i really like mm. this story it was good so, wasn't it the um yeah so they when they do this study they're assuming that it's you know complex life like we find on earth so anything from like sponges up it's, it's complex yeah. and and the thing is we've only got earth as the 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 kind of basis of our experiment essentially yeah it's, you can't it's the find only what you don't know what you're looking for no exactly so we have to go off earth life but based on earth earth life it seems the most you know evolution is not a, a particularly inefficient process in terms of what it uses it try you know it, it's a process that looks for the sort of efficiencies in energy so actually life on earth is probably not how it how it works is probably not unique mm. um it, it will work elsewhere and if co2 is toxic here it's likely that life elsewhere will find co2 toxic as well mm-hmm. anyway we can only base it on earth and mm. so the level of CO2 to, uh, to allow water to be liquid in these what you know traditional sort of habitable zones would make it toxic. Uh, based on simpler life, so if you base it on the kind of simple end of life on Earth, you have to half the size of these habitable zones for it to work. For complex... I poo-poo that, given that there is a possibility that there is life in under Europa or under Enceladus or maybe even uh, methane lakes of Titan. Yeah, we're not talking about... Remote, but... Yeah, yeah. but we... Paul just, said, Paul just said simple life. Yeah, yeah but, but microbes life. will be fine. Like, microbes yeah. can chill out on these planets yeah. and be fine. Yeah, but, but also... But anything like fish... Yeah, but also what you're, you're forgetting is the the things like Europa create their own habitable zone within them. So they're possibly yeah. they're possibly unique in themselves in that the, the zone underneath the ice with the water could be essentially like a, ha- a habitable that has its own heat source and things like that. Yeah. So. Mm. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. Maybe that was a bad example then. But mm. what we're talking about is like you know kind of planets like Earth. You know everyone's looking for this Earth too. If mm. you if you just think about simple life, actually that zone's halved already. For complex life, and so yeah, we're looking your sponges up. Um, the zones are third the size. These mm. these habitable zones are actually quite small. And that does narrow it more. It does narrow yeah. it a lot more. Um, and then it gets worse because they they, <laughs> yeah. they look at some of the nearest planetary uh, neighbours, um, like TRAPPIST-1, Proxima Centauri. Everyone got excited about TRAPPIST-1. Mm. The UV levels of those stars would probably create high levels of carbon monoxide and other ta- toxic gases within the atmospheres. They... they break down the the the, the um, chemistry in the atmospheres so the atmospheres would be dominated by things like carbon monoxide um, and they would be way beyond what life on earth could cope with so that suggests that some many stars like those have no habitable zone yeah they, they, it's actually just not possible in that sense um, unless there's something else you know like Europa with a sort of you know essentially a protective shell of ice and things but in terms of that kind of looking for civilization looking for other you know more complex life possibly what this study is saying is that possibility has shrunk wow you're quite the Debbie Downer I oh, exactly. it's fascinating though this story because everyone bangs on all the time about oh we found planets around an M dwarf yeah. an M dwarf an M dwarf 
and they're the ones in this study which are the worst for life. Well, mm. complex life. Exactly, exactly. Um, it's a good job. I'm so, not going to be trying to get us all excited about a couple of exoplanet discoveries later on then, isn't it? <laughs> well. Sorry, Ralph. <laughs> But this is why this study is so interesting because it's mm. the first time that people have really looked at this in any like sense of detail. That, that's what struck me when I was reading the paper. When I was flicking through it, I thought, Do you know what, this this is the first time I can think of that people have, have actually take basically taken a step back and gone, hang on a minute, we, we've been flying these stars. Everyone's getting excited about these exoplanets, but what are these systems actually like? Yeah. And that was really interesting. That was the first time I'd really read that where people had gone into chemistry of the atmospheres and gone you know what, actually, that star gives off far too much UV and we know that that amount of UV would break down this and it, we would get carbon monoxide if we had an Earth-like atmosphere. So actually, this kind of tramples all over these ideas that, you know, places like Trappist-1 and things could have all these Earth-like planets and actually they're probably not. Mm. That's me done. Well... I think Ralph will just plough straight into your news stories because uh, you're carrying on with a bit of an exoplanet theme as well. We're very exoplanet heavy this episode. Yeah, yeah but that's just the way that the news falls, isn't it? Um, and mm. this was going to be a, a rather exciting time, but Paul's already taken the uh, the fun out of this story already because the uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Carmenas High Resolution Spectrograph at the Calar Alto Observatory in Almeria, Spain, have discovered their eleventh. And tenth exoplanets. Woo hoo! Isn't that newsworthy? Go team! <laughs> so, but the reason why this is so newsworthy is that an international team led by the University of Göttingen in Germany, with participation from researchers at the Institut de Astrophysica de Canarias, have bagged probably the most exciting exoplanet find so far. Unfortunately, it's around a red dwarf star, so as as we were discussing in that last news story, it might mean that it's less hospitable than we originally thought. Mm. And you can also add to that the fact that red dwarf stars are, um, are really quite temperamental anyway. Um, mm. And around a red dwarf star, you're going to probably be tidally locked if you're that close in to be in the habitable yep. zone. But yep. around this red dwarf star called Tea Garden Star, which is only 12 light years away, there That's is... Very close. Exactly. There is. Ooh, what? Is it on that website that Lee sent us Ooh. on the labels? Ooh. I'm going to have a look. Carry on, Ralph. Ooh. Yeah, yeah you a take a look while I'm carrying I'm on. Gonna I, I'm going to look. I'm going to put this poppadom down I'm eating and I'm going to look. Yeah, carry on, Ralph. Yep. Mm. So the star itself was only discovered in 2003 and this international team have been studying its light signature for three years now to find regular light dips that are characteristic of transiting planets. And it's found two. Um, one of them, Tea Garden B, is on the inner edge of the star's habitable zone with an orbital period of five days. And the other is squarely in the habitable zone with an orbital period of 11 and a half days. Um, now, as I was mentioning earlier, if you've got an exoplanet that's around a, a dwarf star, it's going to be closer into the planet. And that's why you've got these ridiculously short orbital periods. Mm -hmm. Um but that's where the habitable zone lies. Now, it, the, that star is probably going to be kicking off a hell of a lot of UV or, or raining down a lot of UV on those planets. Well, and hmm? if it's a red dwarf, hmm? they'll have less UV. They will have less UV, but being that much closer... Ah, I see what you're getting at. Hmm. And, Maybe. as I mentioned earlier, they're quite, they're, dwarf, um, dwarf stars are quite temperamental as well. Um, that they can flare up quite a lot more. Than, yeah, I um, think that's the biggest biggest yeah. issue with them is they're very angry little yeah. stars. Turbulent, yeah. And they're very shouty. Yeah, and we don't know actually whether these planets are tidally locked, but if they are, that means that that, that narrows down again what part of that planet even is habitable because the habitable yeah. part is likely to be that small slither around the equator that it's kind of on the edge of light and dark which isn't yeah. you know doesn't make for a very stable environment for life to evolve but you know um these these planets are actually um uh, earth mass as well or just a slight bit over Earth mass, about 1.1 times the mass of Earth. So, you know, we've got some really good candidates, possibly some of the best candidates we've seen um, for, uh, for habitability. And 
even if they're not habitable, it's great to see that we are starting to probe this Earth mass range of yeah. planets. I mean, yes, we are looking at stars very, very close to us, but that's how it begins, right? Yep, yep. And of course, we've got um, the extremely large telescope and James Webb coming online very shortly that will be able to look for biomarkers in the atmospheres mm. if there are atmospheres. So really exciting time ahead that we are finding these um, potentially habitable planets just as we're about to be able to soon start looking into the uh, the atmospheres for telltale signatures really exciting time and i couldn't find the star on the uh, on oh. the thing oh i know shame maybe it's too dim yeah uh, so next up um the next new NASA missions to be announced will be called Punch and Tracers. Now, neither are particularly inspiring names, and their long-form names are no better whatsoever. <laughs> so we've got the Polarimeter to unify the corona and heliosphere, and Tandem Reconnection and Cusp Electrodynamics Reconnaissance Satellites, which might give you a bit Bloody of an indication I'm John, I'm as to say, what like, they're about. I'm going to say, f*** them. If I meet someone who came up with that acronym, I'm going to hurt them. <laughs> My God. At least they use the first letters. It could be a lot worse. Well, there is that. There is that. But, oh, God, no. Um, so, as, as the name suggests, they're both heliospherics missions uh, to learn more about the sun and the sun's effects, its dynamic effects on space and, and in the Earth environment. And they'll add to the data that's already being collected by other heliospheric spacecraft like SOHO and the Parker Solar Probe to help protect astronauts and spacecraft and satellites in the unprotected glare of the sun and life down here on Earth and also understand more about the effects on the surface of the sun. So PUNCH will focus on the sun's outer atmosphere. That'll be how it generates the solar wind and tracking the solar wind and coronal mass ejections to help us predict them better. Um, mm. That's a $165 million uh, mission, so that's an absolute bargain. That's really cheap. It is, mm. isn't it? Uh, tracers will look back at the magnetic regions encircling Earth's poles to better understand how magnetic fields around Earth interact with those from the sun. And this is going to be particularly useful for understanding uh, new ways to safeguard technology and astronauts in space. Now, both very are scheduled to launch very useful missions as well. And, mm. and mm. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more missions coming out that are in support of the, the manned exploration missions, or the human, I should say, yeah. exploration yeah. missions. Um, mm. And I think we're going to keep seeing those little bits of additional benefits in for uh, um, uh, human exploration missions uh, whenever we get these smaller uh, robotic missions. Um, but they're both scheduled to launch no later than August 2022, and um, no launch system has been confirmed yet that I can find. So um, presumably that's not been announced, but it's going to be a SpaceX, isn't it? Yeah. All right, no, it could be Blue Origin now. Oh, could be, could be. Mm. By the way, um, it won't be NASA. They go to the moon. Yeah, they're going to the moon. Leave it to. Uh, they're going to leave it to commercial. Um, yeah. So now, finally, um, after last month's news story, um, where the trace gas orbiter showed that the Mars Curiosity rover's a dirty, filthy liar <gasps> because there is no significant amount of methane in Mars's atmosphere, Curiosity throws a hissy fit and flings methane in its face like a disgruntled monkey flinging shit. <laughs> <laughs> So for any new listeners, I mean, we go over this all the time, but for any new listeners, methane's of such interest because it's an indicator of either geological activity when Mars is known to be geologically dead or biological activity when we all want to find life on Mars. Um, NASA's Curiosity rover said that there is methane being replenished in Mars' atmosphere. ESA's more sensitive trace gas orbiter said there isn't. Curiosity is now saying, look, 21 parts per billion inside the 96-mile-wide Gale crater I'm exploring – that's a spike of around 50 times the seasonal background concentrations. Mm. We still don't know where it's coming from or why, so it doesn't really take us anywhere. And at 380 kilometres away, ESA can't just give the trace gas orbiter a kick or a tap with a hammer. So I don't really know where this leaves us. He said, she said, that's called the whole thing off. Is it because, what, does it get broken up or something by the it's time it gets to do up with to the altitude, atmosphere? Hasn't it? Yeah, it's or got a bit it's to do just with so diffuse by the time it gets up into the atmosphere that the trace gas orbiter wouldn't be able to detect it anyway, and Curiosity can only find it because it's basically being blasted in the you face. You would think by the name Trace Gas Orbiter, it might be quite good at picking up very, very faint signatures of... But, of, but maybe not through the atmosphere. But then what if it's just one tiny little puff that sort of goes... And then that's it. 
I feel well, like... Well, at 21 parts per billion, it is just a little puff. Mm. Yeah. So is that, by the time it gets up there, maybe half of it gets destroyed for... I, I don't know. I'm not a chemist. I, I don't know how it works. Yeah. But is it just that it is so traced by the time it gets up into the atmosphere that it can't detect it? So... That well, the seasonal background do... calculations are about half a part per billion, so yeah. um, that's probably what it's detecting up in the in in the atmosphere. But the but this is kind of this seems so obvious to us that I'm surprised we've not read anything about this as being a possible reason for it. That's what makes me a bit suspicious. Mm. I just don't know. No, I mean, yeah, there there has to be something more subtle going on that we're not factoring in. I I just. Oh. Because what I mean, <laughs> if there is like bacteria or something that's like in these tiny little nested pockets, maybe there is just so little of it. The thing is, I don't know. the thing is, really what weird. what I think what we always forget is it's a flipping great planet. Yeah. Yeah, you, know, you try. You know, you think about kind of Earth and how big it is, and gases coming out of geological things out of, of living things and there were those little mm. wisps of gas things like even the interactions tiny... between stone and water yeah mm. but they're, but they're also tiny on a, on a you know on a thing that is massive and we kind of get this image that you know mars is you know you, you go there and it's mars but mars is a flipping great planet yeah. you know, thousands of miles <laughs> it's like yeah. Yeah. huge huge thing the atmosphere around it we we're, we're never going to answer this with with one satellite and one rover, no, that's not possible. You I, couldn't answer that. You couldn't answer that question on Earth. With with imagine driving a car around at the speed that that thing goes at, and having one satellite around Earth and trying to answer a fundamental question about its geology or or its you know life or something with with just that with one small well, car. It would even be like a, count the number of humans on Earth. Yeah. Exactly. It's just not... So we, we kind of... I think, you know, people are expecting the, the miracle answer. It's not possible. It's one rover in one tiny crater mm. and one tiny satellite that's orbiting around. You're never going to get this answer until... until Send a fleet. Exactly. Until you go... Until... Oh, shit. There we go. They can send Starlink to Mars, right? And they can put little <laughs> uh, trace gas detectors floating around Mars... There we are. Has it gone quiet? Nobody seems to be bothering about Starlink anymore. It's almost like it was a bit of a flash in the pan that people just want to get outraged over, and now everyone's gone quiet. Funny. That, I think isn't it? it's no. I don't know. I think Elon is in conversation with people to uh, minimise the effect. Really? So yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, he's he's going to put it into a everything into a higher orbit, is he? Oh, is he no, going to send spaceship which, up to go? Which, let's face it, Elon's Elon's got a history of getting high. So, well, there is that. <laughs> Elon is doing absolutely nothing else. It's a commercial venture, and he is doing absolutely nothing to them. He might be pacifying them on Twitter or whatever, but everyone's going quiet anyway because no one can be bothered to be outraged for more than a day or two. Yeah, <laughs> I've even forgotten what it was about. Exactly. And so, time for the big news story. And this is all about how the Hubble tuning fork is, well, bollocks, really. Get the fuck out of here. I know, right? It's a great story. So you, you're all familiar with the Hubble tuning fork. Um, it was a diagram drawn up around 1926-1927 by Edwin Hubble, uh, classifying galaxies into ellipticals and then two types of spiral galaxies. And it has been accepted science yep. in astronomy. Every astrophysics student took this as being the way things were yep yep for 100 years i sat an exam on it yeah i did there you go yeah yeah and the key thing about this is that galaxies with bigger bulges have more tightly wound spiral arms turns out that's crap mm. and we're not going to talk about it too much more in this episode because we actually have an interview done by paul with the lead scientist on this work professor karen masters and that is going to be coming out in a podcast extra on the 20th. So look out for that to get all the key lowdown on this amazing news story. Best thing mm. about this news story, this result has come from Citizen Science. Yes. Yes. Right, Sky Guys. 
We survived the equinox seemingly unscathed, and now we can look forward to the nights getting ever longer and darker. With the nights starting to beckon once again, Paul's going to kick us off with something to get us back into the swing of things. Well, Jupiter, if there's only one thing you need to encourage you to get out the scope um, in the height of summer, it's the king himself sitting bright and pretty in the southern sky after sunset. Um, we had opposition on the 10th of June, so views are still big and bright, and, and while it's low in the sky, it's, so it's not you know, great for atmospheric conditions, Jupiter never disappoints. Track down the red spot transits, look out for the moon transits and occultations, and if you have a large scope, take a look at the cloud belts and dynamic cloud features on that fast rotating world. Ten hours around, people. You can get it in, the, in a night in winter. True that. The other major solar system look out, other than what Ralph's going to talk about, the Saturn opposition, um, is the moon on the night of the 16th, when you'll be able to catch a partial eclipse. Mm. Ooh. Ooh. 65% of the surface will be in shadow by 10.30 in the evening. Moon rises at 9, um, and it'll be very obvious as it comes up that it's starting to fall into eclipse. And um, The eclipse ends with the penumbral phase, um, just for 1.30 in the morning. So enjoy yeah, that. That's cool. That'll be a nice summer evening, sitting there supping wine, looking at an eclipse. Mm. And why not? Ralph. Well then, Ralph. I'm going to start off with a nice challenge for anyone hunting around the Galactic Centre for summer treats, and you should be scanning around the Galactic Centre mm -hmm. this time of year. Um, amidst the dozens of clusters and nebulae on offer in the south this month, we also have the 170 kilometre wide 18 Melpomene, which I bet you'd never even heard of. I hadn't. Um, and that's going to be at opposition in Scutum. Had you? No. But I'm glad that you believed me. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on It shows on that I'm fire. getting more and more convincing in yes. my old age. <laughs> I remember when you used to be young and naive, Jen. And I couldn't lie for toffee. Now <laughs> I just sh them out. You wait. When she actually has her PhD, she'll be able to say anything. Anything, yeah. yeah. It'd be like, trust me, I'm a doctor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It'd be great. Like, yes, it will. Cows, shit, Tiffany cufflinks. And we'll go like, do they? <laughs> oh, okay. And I'd be like, yes, it's because of the arrangement of their four stomachs allows them to precisely meld the yeah. metal into yeah. the required shape. Yes. You're getting good at this already, Jen. Yes, you must be the third year of your PhD, are you? <laughs> yeah, third year. <laughs> oh, see, just practice, isn't it? So on the 3rd of July, just past uh, midnight, it'll pass within 1.3 astronomical units of us, reaching a peak brightness of magnitude 9.2. So still faint as it passes from the left-hand edge of the shield towards Epsilon Scuti. So I'd advise consulting a star chart from the British Astronomical Association, Stellarium, or your preferred observing app. But for any Londoners or Baker Street Irregulars, John Russell Hind discovered this silicate and metal asteroid in 1852 using the 7-inch Dolland refractor in the Regent's Park Observatory that the Baker Street Irregular astronomers are now bringing back to life with a Cook refractor of the period. Oh, nice. Isn't that nice? That is nice. Hmm. Then, just a shade lower in the same quadrant of the sky on the 9th of July, we have the ring world of Saturn at opposition, as Paul mentioned earlier, meaning that it'll be directly between us and the Sun. Now, this will mark the closest and therefore the brightest Saturn will be this year at Beautiful. 836 million miles and magnitude zero. Wow. So effectively as bright as Arcturus, Vega and Capella. Uh, and that'll be from the 8th to the 10th of July when it'll be uh, peaking at that brightness, uh, though in reality it'll be no discernibly dimmer all month. Um, so, all July, Saturn will be obvious any time after dusk above the southern horizon as the non-twinkling bright star to the naked eye. In binoculars, you'll pick out the rings in a small telescope or reveal the gap between the rings, the Cassini division, and probably at least two of Saturn's 62 known moons, Titan and Rhea, despite getting no higher than 15 degrees above the horizon. And finally, although visible to some degree for much of July and August, the southern Delta Aquarius meteor shower peaks on the night of the 28th into the 29th of July and gets us warmed up for next month's Perseids. The radiance of the southern Delta Aquarius, unsurprisingly Delta Aquarii, rises above the southeastern horizon just after 11pm in the UK and rises to 21 degrees high by the time it's dead south around 3am. The zenith allowably rate, or the number of meteors you'd expect to see per hour if it were at the zenith under perfect skies, ranges between 16 and 25, but they are bright despite being relatively low on the horizon. And with the downward meteors being lost in the gloom, they appear to fan up and outwards like distant fireworks. So that's quite nice. Oh, I like that. Hmm. So now we have our choice of object for the month. 
And, well, I mean, what else is it going to be? Other than the moon. Woo! Has to be the moon this month. Hmm, why? Why does it have to be the moon hmm. this month? Maybe they'll have to listen to our part <gasps> two episode to find out. Is that the part two that's coming out earlier this month on the 10th to make way for the interview podcast extra on the 20th? Indeed, it is that very same episode, <laughs> Ralph. Thank you for mentioning it. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, just lame is segue. <laughs> <laughs> so... We're going to start off with the five factoids because we're going to assume that you don't need any help finding where the moon is in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Look up at the big shiny thing that's in the sky at night. That's the thing you're looking for. <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> so, factoids. Off you go, Ralph. Oh, me first. Right, okay. The Your moon first. is slowly moving away from the Earth at a rate of almost four centimetres a year, around the same amount that fingernails grow in a year. This is because tidal forces transfer a little bit of energy from the Earth to the Moon all the time. And this energy loss means that we spin a little bit slower and our days slowly get longer. Oh, look at that. Mm, even Whoa. the Moon's not sticking around, it's so crap. Yeah. Mm. Why would it? Yeah. Right, the Moon. The Moon is the fifth largest natural satellite in the solar system. Beating it at Ganymede, Io, Callisto, and Titan. We do, however, have the largest planet moon ratio of the planet. No, Pluto doesn't count. Oh, I was just thinking, Pluto, mm -hmm. Charon, you're right. So I doesn't thought count. better put that in. Mm. Yeah. Mm. There is no such thing as the dark side of the moon. Try telling Pink Floyd that. Both sides of the moon get illuminated by the sun over the course of its orbit. But the moon spins once on its axis for every orbit of the Earth, which means that we only ever get to see one side of it. The moon is surprisingly far away, 384,000 kilometres. Putting this in perspective, you can fit 30 Earths between the Earth and the moon. Last fact. Because the surface of the moon is not uniform, first quarter is actually a little brighter than third quarter. The surface of the moon illuminated at first quarter is just a little bit better at reflecting sunlight. I did not know that one. Mm. It's a cool one, isn't it? That isn't is it? a very cool one. I did not know that. Huh. Bonus fact! All the craters on the surface of the moon are named after scholars, scientists, artists and explorers. Some famous names that you can find on the moon are Copernicus, Tycho and Picard. Not named after Jean-Luc, of course, but 17th century French astronomer Jean Picard. Don't confuse him with Jean-Luc. But apparently <laughs> they've got the same first name. <laughs> Not John. So those are your interesting facts about the moon. Um... Remember, look at all different phases of the moon because the Terminator, so that's the boundary between the night and dark, it highlights different features every day. Mm. So, you know, the moon is always different. Also, bear in mind, if you look at the moon um, when it's full, you may want to use a polarizer just to dim it down a bit because it is actually very, very bright when it's full. Yeah, and it, it, apart from the fact that it actually does hurt your eyes. Um, it does, it does. You, you will pick out a lot more features because you tend to ignore the moon when it's when it's um, at full because you think it's, it's quite featureless. But if you use a polarising filter or just a, a, a standard filter, it really will be more enjoyable. Definitely. So, we've uh, spent some time ogling at our nearest neighbour. Let's have a look a bit further away. Paul. As it's summer and the sky isn't really dark, I'm sticking with a nice bright target in a ficus. Uh, with two a two for one deal on this one, this is globular clusters M10 and M12. Ooh. So Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, um, is a constellation that can annoy astrologers with, because um, of course the sun spends a great deal of time in it, making it the thirteenth zodiac sign, six to the thirty first of December. If you're interested, I'm not. If you're born between six and the thirty first December, you can be one of those assholes who says they're Ophiuchus. Mm. <laughs> if I can, surely. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's pretty indistinct house kind of shaped constellation between Hercules uh, sorry below Hercules uh, for M10 and 12 find the Yed stars as they're called which is Yed Prior and Yed Posterior they're at the bottom uh, they're a wide pair of stars in the west of the constellation move east from them towards the middle of the constellation and the unmistakable blur of globular clusters should fall into view uh, these globs are actually pretty close uh, in reality. Um, they're probably only separated by about a thousand light years. Um, 
so um, they, they kind of appear very similar. Uh, both are about 20,000 light years from Earth. M12 is the looser of the two globs uh, with a less concentrated core, while M10 appears smaller but is the brighter of the pair. There you go. Well, with the beginning and the end of July being the best time for deep sky objects this month, in the few hours after midnight when it's really dark enough to observe, I'm going to make life easier for you and point you towards the zenith, the highest point in the sky where the atmosphere is the thinnest and the best observing conditions can be found. Looking in that direction, you can't fail to spot the two bright stars of Vega and Deneb, which, along with the lower Altair, make up the Summer Triangle. And we'll use Vega and Deneb to pick out two wonders of the summer sky that most amateur astronomers know well, but every beginner should be able to find without any difficulty. The first is Epsilon Lyrae, a star that can be split into two stars with the mere threat of magnification, and then split in two <laughs> again by cranking up that magnification, either with a zoom lens or by switching eyepieces. So to find Epsilon Lyrae, or the double-double, Find the bright bluey white star at the head of the small parallelogram of Lyrae the Harp directly overhead around midnight and move your scope or find a scope and outstretch fingers width in the direction of Deneb, the other bright bluey white star overhead <laughs> at the head of the huge crucifix shaped constellation of Cygnus. You'll find there a much dimmer magnitude 5 star that will split and split identically again and it's far more fun than a sky guide can convey. Oh, it is good fun. Mm-hmm. To find the other much-loved and must-know binary star overhead this time of year, find that other bright star we used earlier, Deneb, at the top of the cross of Cygnus. Cygnus, as the name suggests, is actually a swan rather than a cross, with Deneb in the tail of the bird. So move up the back of the swan to the bright star in the body, or the centre of the cross if you like, and continue that line twice as far again to the star that makes out the head of the bird, Albirio, which appears to the naked eye to be a single star of magnitude 3. If this is the first time you've seen Albirio and you're using this guide to locate it, I'll pause a moment while you increase the magnification and then say, wow, f*** me. <laughs> you're welcome. So to finish, we have the moon this month, which begins with new on the 2nd. First quarter is on the 9th. Full is on the 16th, of course, with an eclipse. And the last quarter on the 25th. Clear skies and happy hunting. So, finally, we're going to finish up with a question. Very quick one this month. And this comes from our good friend Seamaster GMT on Twitter, who says, So, by your standards, if I fail to come up with a question, I can expect to be terminated soon upon your arrival from Cydonia Base. Yes. Well, the answer to that is yes. Yes. But that's not the question. Uh, the question is, all right, how many jelly beans could fit inside the moon? Oh, now that is a great question. That goes back to... Great question. Do you remember, Paul, one of the mm. first questions we covered on the show was from um, Neil at Tring Astronomy, who was asking how many hobnobs would fit from here to the Andromeda Galaxy. Oh, do you This is like that kind of question. Cracking I question. I love these yeah. questions. Oh, that took, a, that took a while to and answer. And this is a perfect example of... Well, you'll see. I'll get onto it. Anyhow. Fantastic mathematics. So, Off you go, Jen. <laughs> On the surface, this sounds like a very straightforward question. You take the volume of the moon, divide that by the volume of a jelly bean, and that gives you the number of jelly beans. So we're going to pretend that jelly beans are cylinders, and then we can say that the volume of one jelly bean is about 3.4 centimetres cubed, if it's like two centimetres long and one and a half wide or so. Then, assuming that the moon is a sphere, perfect sphere, the radius of the moon is about 1,740 kilometres which gives us a volume of about 22 quintillion cubic metres, which is 22 with 18 noughts after it, or 22 septillion cubic centimetres, which is 22 with 24 noughts after it. But it's not as easy as that, right? Even though, you know, we, we've got our two volumes, you'd think, here we are, there's our answer, no. Jelly beans are irregular shapes, which means that there are going to be gaps between them. Now, about 20% of the space is going to be air, according to people who have experimented with putting jelly beans in jars. So factoring this in, I reckon you can fit about 5.4 septillion jelly beans inside the moon. Right, so 5.4 followed by 24 noughts. But then, the moon's not a perfect sphere. 
It's got hills and valleys and craters. And then that opens up a whole new can of worms, right? And of course, jelly beans, right? Their sizes vary brand to brand. And then what about all the squashing you'd get as you pile more and more jelly beans on top of each other as you're like filling them up inside the moon, right? And this is a perfect example of why science is hard. So I'm stick with my answer of 5.4 septillion, but I bet you it's still less than the amount that Costco's selling a year. Wow. 5.4 septillion. That's diabetes, isn't it? It's a lot of jelly beans. That is a lot of, lot of jelly beans. Alan, on that sweet note, I'm going to end. So thanks once again for tuning in to another hour of random drivel from the mouths of two aliens and one insane human. And of course, the occasional introduction from one enslaved deck master. We do hope you have as much fun listening to us as we do making the show. If you do, please leave us a review somewhere. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or email us at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Check out our new website. It's not just fancy. It's fancy schmancy. <laughs> and if you want to join us under the dark skies of the Brecon Beacons International Dark Sky Reserve on the weekend of the 21st to the 24th of September, we're now taking bookings and the large pictures or those with electric hookups do sell out fast. So head over to astrocamp.awesomeastronomy.com. Uh, this will be the Apollo moon landing anniversary themed Astrocamp. And as always, if you're a fan of the show, you get to hang out and observe with your favourite stroke tolerable podcast hosts. And it gives you the opportunity to ply us with alcohol for your entertainment only. So, until our space exploration show on the 10th of the month, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com If you want us to read your comments out on the show send us your views, opinions questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there Thanks for listening and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission